Hi, my name is Yawa Shio Sai. I will be taking the yes side argument when it comes to the ecosystem services. Ecosystem services play a major role in our environment, and they are the bridge between people and nature. Ecosystem services are resources that we need from the environment, such as water. I'll be taking the viewpoint that ecosystem services are important for our survival and should be evaluated when it comes to economic cost. My argument will be based on the importance of valuing ecosystem services, the importance of the ecosystem services when it comes to sustainable development, how ecosystems influence the products we buy in supermarkets, and the likelihood of ecosystem services and how it might affect the house we buy. Valuations of ecosystem services will contribute towards better decision making, ensuring that policy assessments fully take into account the costs and benefits to the natural environment. According to the Millennium Assessment, around two-thirds of the services provided by nature to humankind are found to be in deficit worldwide. In effect, the benefits reaped from our engineering of the planet have been achieved by running down natural capital assets. Valuing the benefits for the present and the future from the natural environment illustrates its significant contribution to well-being and high dependency of society on its ecological base. The human population is expected to grow by 9 billion by 2050, which will pose tremendous amount of stress for natural resources. Agricultural land is said to be 40% of the global land surface, and a large portion of land is being converted into agricultural land in the expense of natural land. Conversions will increase in the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus, eutrophication and pesticides. The sudden disappearance of the honeybee Apis melitea, which was due to colony collapse disorder, had catastrophic financial outcomes. An estimated 90% of commercially grown field, crop fields, citrus and fruits depend on honeybees pollination services. The United Nations TEB report stated that Conserving nature might be 10 to 100 times more valuable than the cost of saving the habitats and species associated with the provision of services. Ecosystems and its services have potential to migrate or at least diminish some potentially catastrophic impacts from weather events. A typical example would be the value of mangrove ecosystems have in the protection against coastal flooding and storms. These protection services can enhance or detract the value of ecosystem services. Greetings from the darkest corner of Africa. My name is Leonardo Sukunki, born in South Africa. I am a third year student at the University of the Western Cape. I will be arguing a contrary view that stresses that, for most of the values that humans attach to biodiversity and ecosystem services, the pricing approach is very much inadequate, if not misleading and obsolete. This approach inaccurately implies that decisions with important environmental impacts can be based on a single scale of value. There has been widespread use of the cost benefit analysis as the exclusive tool for decision making about environmental policy but there are many limitations with the use of this concept. For example, the US Flood Control Act. In summary, this legislation stated that a public project should be given the go-ahead if benefits to whomever they accumulate were in excess of the estimated costs. This concept implies that all benefits and costs are to be considered, but now the problem with this is that the public agencies were not able to give the monetary value to environmental effects even those that were predictable in quantitative terms. For instance, engineers For example, degradation of vegetation in developing countries leads to a decrease in available fuel. Consequently, animal dung has to be used instead of fertilizers, and farmers must therefore replace, chem must replace dung with chemical fertilizers. By computing the cost of these chemical fertilizers, the monetary value for the degradation of vegetation can then be calculated. A classic example of contingent valuation methods is to ask the amount of money individuals are willing to pay to ensure the continued existence of such a species as a blue whale. However, the existence of the blue whale does not take into account the potential indirect services and benefits provided by these animals. With this approach, there is a huge risk that animals with low or no aesthetic appeal or whose biological role has not been properly advertised will be given a low value even if they play a fundamental role in, in ecological function. Finally, one of the major problems with the cost-benefit analysis is that its outcome depends heavily on the group of the people that is taken as a reference for the valuation, particularly on their income. One example of this is the one example of this dependence is the Exxon Valdez uh, oil spill in 1989. The U.S. population was used as a reference group to calculate the damage to the existence of the existence value of the affected species and ecosystem using contingent valuation methods. 
Exxon were ordered to pay $5 billion to compensate the people of Alaska for their losses. This huge figure was a result of the high income of the U.S. population. Now say for instance, the same incidents had occurred in Siberia where salaries are lower, the outcome would certainly have been different. This example shows just how faulty contingent valuation methods are. Somewhere between the assignment of zero value to biodiversity and the assignment of an infinite value lie more sensible methods to assign value to biodiversity than the price tag techniques suggested by the new wave of environmental economists. Rather than collapsing every measure of social and environmental value onto a monetary axis, environmental impact assessment and multi-attribute analysis allow for explicit consideration of intangible non-monetary values along with classical economic assessment, assessment which of course remains important.